Funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video. Hello everyone, this is the fourth in a series of six reviews I'm doing with Space Tree Studios on the BoJack Horseman series. If you've never watched these videos, I highly recommend starting with our Season 1 retrospective instead. In this video, we're going to be going into BoJack Season 4 in depth, so spoilers for the entire show thus far will follow. So at the end of our last retrospective, I said that BoJack Season 3 was the last season of the show I'd give a 10 out of 10 score to. And this made many of y'all question, Wait a minute, what about Season 4? It's so amazing and well written and stuff! Well, you're right about all those things. BoJack Season 4 is still a phenomenal season of television. I mean, none of these seasons are bad after all, not even Season 1. BoJack Season 4 just kinda misses the mark in a couple of areas, mostly with the side characters and their plot lines. However, this season does still have some of the best storylines and individual episodes in the entire show's run. Season 4 is where things really start to get more experimental in terms of how they tell their stories going forward. They literally dip their toes with fish out of water and stop the presses in having episodes without dialogue or told in flashbacks. But now we get episodes with more art style shifts, more unique framing devices, episodes without Bojack at all, episodes with only Bojack and none of the other main cast, and other unique takes going forward in this season and beyond. Much like how Season 3 put a cap on the overarching Hollywood plotline started in the first season, Season 4 is like a new Season 1, kicking off a new saga for the show. And to kick off this season, let's kick Bojack out, get him out of here. This is a Mr. Peanut Butter episode now. Episode 1, See Mr. Peanut Butter Run, picks up immediately where his story left off in Season 3, with his ex wife Katrina pushing him into running for governor. But there's just one problem. It's 2017 and there is no active campaign that year. Their solution? Challenge the current governor to a ski race for the privilege of being governor. This works because reasons. It's so funny because of how random this idea is. Mr. Peanut Butter literally throws it out out of nowhere. Like, hey, ski race, bro, you and me, 1v1 me, do it, you won't. And after so many legal hurdles are overcome to make it happen, Mr. Peanut Butter reveals that he doesn't actually know how to ski. This is legitimately one of my favorite jokes within the entire show. Like, I don't know how they come up with this kooky stuff for this character. It's a delight. As is their big ski race where Mr. Peanut Butter performs poorly, but it doesn't matter because Todd wins through his usual Todd shenanigans, only to resign as governor and force the governorship to be decided by voting, as usual. Again, this is what I love about this show, creating wacky scenarios for hilarious one-off episodes, instead of just doing the easy thing and starting with a normal election. It is a certified comedy gold moment. This also sets up Mr. Peanut Butter's conflict with Diane for this season. Diane, of course, being the reasonable one, can clearly tell that Mr. Peanut Butter would be an awful governor, being forced to pick between her morals and her relationship. During all of this, Diane tries to vent to the one person who has been a constant to her during the past three seasons. Bojack, you know, the title character, who is not in this episode at all. This is the first of three episodes in which Bojack does not make a physical appearance. The only time we hear him is when his voicemail is full after Diane calls him for months on end with no answer. So, where's Bojack? Well, William, he's gone! I couldn't do that well. Episode 1 was a solid and super funny start to the season, but episode 2, The Old Sugarman House, is without a doubt one of the best episodes of the entire series. We start off by seeing Bojack exactly where we left him at the end of season 3, ready to join the horde of horses he sees before him, ready to start running and not stop. But before he can leave it all behind, a call from Diane that he doesn't quite have the strength to answer is what brings him back to reality. She always did keep him anchored after all, so it's only fitting. Bojack doesn't run off, but he doesn't return home either. Instead, driving away as we hear Michelle Branch's incredible cover of A Horse With No Name. Really glad this show introduced me to this cover. It's so amazing. It was actually after this season that they released a soundtrack for the show, containing songs like the aforementioned Horse With No Name, the various character theme songs, Stars, the Fish Out of Water score, etc. We could probably talk about how the show uses music in more detail, but that should probably be saved for some other time. Eventually, Bojack makes it to the old sugar in place, his grandparents' summer home. It is at this point the episode is split into two halves. One part flashback, back to when Beatrice, Bojack's mom, was a child and spent her summers there with her parents and her brother, Cracker Jack. And the second part, Bojack in present day attempting to renovate the now disheveled house and his interactions with his new neighbor, Eddie. What are you, some kind of troll or something? What this episode does so well is juxtapose the grief of Bojack's grandmother, Honey, who just lost her son, Lin-Manuel Miranda, to the war, with Bojack's grief over losing Sarah. 
Sierra Lynn. The episode frequently showcases past and present events taking place at the same time. It's a really clever narrative device that makes you feel the urgency and emotion of both plot lines simultaneously. And I don't think it would have been as effective or memorable if they had simply cut back and forth between the two times. There are extended segments where we're just focusing on one of the time periods, of course, and they effectively tell the story as well. But those simultaneous moments of storytelling are what really hit hard. Let's break this up. We'll start with timeline A, Beatrice's past. This shows the beginning of how she became the monster she'd eventually become, one of the main running themes throughout this season. Yeah, one of the main characters getting development this year is Bojack's mother. Go figure. Anyway, at this point in time, the big issue she and her family have to deal with is the death of her older brother Crackerjack, who was killed fighting in World War II. Before his death, we get a glimpse at their last holiday together, showing a heartwarming moment between Crackerjack and Honey playing I Will Always Think of You on the piano. While the season does focus on Beatrice for the most part, the death of her brother doesn't hit her as hard as her mother. Which makes sense, as losing a child is one of the worst things a parent can possibly experience. As the holiday goes on, her mother struggles to deal with her grief, culminating at a military party celebrating the end of the war. Honey begins to play the same song from earlier, but it is clear she is utterly destroyed by her grief. We'll come back to this moment later. Point is, like Bojack, Beatrice's childhood upbringing shaped the person she would become. Hers born of tragedy, Bojack's from abuse. Speaking of Bojack... Bojangles is obsessed with fixing up the old Sugarman house, and eventually, he begrudgingly accepts the help of his flying neighbor, Eddie. Eddie do be pretty fly, though, because his efforts are invaluable in getting the old place fixed up. The two of them start to bond, and it's really nice, even though Eddie has some sort of secret about why he doesn't fly. I wonder if that will ever get focused on. Anyway, they realize they're missing the weather vane that used to be on the house, and that it's been stolen by the drab little crabs over at the barn. So Eddie creates a distraction while Bojack goes for the weather vane, and the distraction just happens to be the song, I Will Always Think of You. Here we get one of those moments where the past and present collide, like I mentioned earlier. Honey and Eddie have both lost someone and are trying to cope by singing the song that reminds them of their lost loved ones. It's a pretty magical moment to see them duetting despite being separated by space and time. And yet, the song wasn't enough for either of them and they both become consumed by their grief. Eddie starts sobbing at the piano while being chased by giant enemy crabs, and Honey gets drunk and starts kissing Lin-Manuel Miranda's friend, only to let Beatrice drive home and ultimately crash the car. It's a rough situation for Honey, but at least Bojack and Eddie's night went pretty well. But of course, this is Bojack Horseman we're talking about. Things never go well. Bojack can't quit while he's ahead, so he takes a fall in order to get Eddie to start flying again, thinking that'll be the perfect capper on this great night. But no, he's pissed, since he vowed to never fly again due to his dead wife getting hit by a plane while flying, which was his mistake. And now Bojack has triggered those repressed memories, which was HIS mistake! So now, this friendship that we just spent the entire episode building up is torn down in an instant. Such is life for Bojack the Horse Boy. It's all pretty tragic, culminating in Eddie blurting out that he doesn't want to live when they get back to the ground. A real sad posting hour. After this incident, Bojack finally calls Diane in order to escape this new life in Michigan that he escaped to in order to escape from LA. Not to be confused with Escape from LA, the season 2 episode in which he escapes from LA by escaping to New Mexico. This is a different escape, to a different place because it's a different episode of a different season. Get on with it. So yeah, he calls Diane. It's a good payoff for all the missed messages he had from her over the course of the episode, and it reaffirms just how significant his friendship with her truly is. At this point in the call, James told me to discuss Zilobotomy, and uh, yeah, I don't know how to segue into that, but uh, Beatrice's mom gets a fucking lobotomy. Do I need to say more than that she gets a goddamn lobotomy? There's an absolutely crushing scene where Beatrice goes to her mom to talk about what happens, and her mother is kept mostly in shadows until the final reveal where you can see the scar, leaving us with the haunting line, Why I have half a mind. Yeah, this kind of speaks for itself. There's a good debate for this likely being the moment that breaks Beatrice. This is her point of no return. The episode does foreshadow this in an early conversation. But I've got half a mind to kiss you with that smart mouth. Well, that half you can keep. Yeah, traumatizing. Now you know what I was getting at earlier. The episode ends with Bojack tearing down the house that he and Eddie built together. In essence, letting the past die. Killing it if he has to. <laughs> In the end, this episode was just an elaborate destroy-build-destroy destroy tribute. 
And yeah, that's the episode. A haunting and shocking deconstruction of grief and loss and tragedy. It's one of the best episodes the series has ever produced, as I said before. And the best part? It's not even the peak of the season. Anyway, Mood Whiplash time, baby! It's a Todd episode! Hooray! Can I just say that I started watching Breaking Bad recently, and so now every time Todd speaks, all I hear is Jesse? Now that's Mood Whiplash. You can't keep doing shitty things and then feel bad about yourself like that makes it okay! As we talked in the past, Todd has been used mostly as a foil to other characters. They haven't given him much to do on his own. It was always in service to the others. But from season 4 on, they really start to flesh him out, give him his own storylines and relationships. He's actively furthering the plot himself, not just by supporting Bojack or Mr. Peanut Butter, but just having his own plotline. And this episode is the start of it. The episode begins with a group of orchestra members recounting Todd's many accomplishments in life, giving him sort of a superhero mythos before showing the man himself as we know him. From there we see Todd running a plethora of errands for the other main cast, such as working for Princess Carolyn, and pretending to be Hollywood superstar Courtney Portnoy's boyfriend, accidentally convincing Mr. Peanut Butter to support fracking, tearing a huge rift in both the ground and his marriage, and helping out one of the new faces of Season 4 get into contact with the big horse lad himself. This episode is the proper introduction of the horse girl we saw at the end of season 3. Hollyhock, insert name here. No, you gotta say her full name. <sighs> okay. Hollyhock, Mannheim, Mannheim, Guru, Turbo Robinson, 358 over 2, Zilla Schlag, Mafra King, Ghidorah, Hussein, Fonzarelli, Final Chapter Prologue, McQuack, All Out Attack, Arcade Edition. No came out of nowhere, lightning fast. She has eight dads. It makes sense in context. So yeah, Hollyhock thinks she's the biological daughter of Bojack, and she enlists Todd's help in order to run a DNA test to find out for sure. And the DNA test is a match. That was easy. I guess it's a done deal. Throughout this ordeal, Todd is forced to interact with Bojack, who he doesn't really want anything to do with anymore, based off of the end of Season 3. Cutting Bojack out of his life has really worked for him, and I like the fact that even though they end things off in this episode on good terms, they're still not going to be friends again. Bojack admits that he got more than he ever deserved from Todd, and Todd seems to forgive Bojack for everything he's done. I really like the fact that one of the three deliverers of the F-bomb from the previous three seasons has made up with Bojack, even if that F-bomb is gonna stick in terms of them not really being part of each other's lives that much anymore. Because it does stick. This is the only episode of the season where Bojack and Todd interact, which ties into what we said earlier about this really being the season where Todd comes into his own as a character, rather than supporting Bojack. Because Todd has another big plotline this season which I guess I better start talking about. So, I don't think this is some big secret, but I don't know if it's well known to y'all either. I guess I rarely ever bring it up, but then again, neither does Todd. Hooray! Consistency! So yeah, I'm actually on the asexual spectrum, and I didn't really know what that meant for a while, or if there was even a term for it. Neither did Todd, as it turns out, who spent season 3 trying to figure out why he didn't seem to be into sex. By the end of the season, he still wasn't quite sure how to label himself, but he did receive reassurance from Emily that what he was feeling was valid and okay. And here in season 4, watching him finally learn the term for it and say it out loud is really neat. It's a very unique journey of self-actualization that media rarely ever shows, and it was such a great idea to take the character in this direction. If Todd was written from the start to be a token asexual character, that would feel like pandering, because that's kind of what it is. But when you take a lovable character who's never really had an established sexuality, and have them discover their orientation as the series progresses, that's really special. And needless to say, this plotline for Todd just came at the perfect time for me. Cause as I mentioned, no other media really does this sort of thing. I hear fan bases going off like Peridot from Steven Universe is asexual, Pidge from that hideous awful Voltron show is ace. And then I watch them and it's like, sure, I guess you can read it that way, but it's not like explicit. Actually getting something concrete for a change is a whole different feeling. Like, I didn't know I wanted that sort of representation until I actually got it. It really is a special feeling. From what I've seen, the ace community seems really happy with this direction for Todd. Because again, it's Todd. We already love him, and I especially love the fact that this isn't his only character trait. He's a fully fleshed out character who just happens to be ace. Sometimes I do wish they did more stuff with it, particularly in the later seasons, but for the most part, I'm really happy with this. And I'm also really happy that the episode ends with Todd not returning to the orchestra to play his triangle solo. He always puts others before himself, but tonight, he's putting himself first going to an ace meetup, tying in the theme of self-actualization on two fronts. 
good for him. But, after focusing on an asexual character for an entire episode, episode 4 must compensate by being the f***ing episode. Todd may hate fucking, but Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter hate fuck. Insert laugh track here. Goop, that's a cricket. Yes. <laughs> oh sure, everyone's a comedian. The governor race heats up as Mr. Peanut Butter has to pick his policies, further dividing him and Diane. To compensate for this, the two have hate sex. A lot. That's about it for those two until later. In the meantime, Bojack and Princess Carolyn get their storyline started for the season. At only four episodes in, wow. Bojack begins his crusade to unite Hollyhock with her biological mother, while Princess Carolyn begins her quest to become a mother. Motherhood is kind of a big theme for this season. Beatrice and her mother, Bojack and Beatrice, Hollyhock in the search for her mother, Princess Carolyn and her struggles to become one. We already know about Diane and her parents, the only real outlier here is Todd. But don't worry, we'll get there eventually. Not this season, though. Let's circle back. Bojack recounts all the women he would have feasibly slept with that could potentially be Hollyhock's mother. They run into multiple dead ends, and their only lead turns out to be lying to them just to get closer to Bojack. Meanwhile, Princess Carolyn struggles with infertility as her and Ralph attempt to conceive. It also marks the return of the only albino rhino gyno I know. That's fun. Not much major happens here aside from the setup. Hey Ralph, stop shooting blanks. Speaking of shooting... Oh no, it is current political issue episode time, my dudes. And by current, I mean every damn year. Thoughts and Prayers is an episode about gun violence and how sleazy Hollywood executives are only concerned about it because it hurts the bottom line of their movies that glorify gun violence. Out of all the political episodes so far, I think the satire might be the sharpest in this one. It's clever and funny, but also really kind of sad, which is what this satire was aiming for, so it hits its mark. As an aside, this episode is one of many examples of why I've never really been a fan of Princess Carolyn that much. She's one of the people who perpetuates Hollywood and its corrupt systems, and we can see here that she, along with Lenny Turtletob, is more concerned about profits than human life being lost. It's kind of weird that this aspect of her character is often ignored by people who say she's the most tragic and relatable character in the whole show. I agree that her life is pretty tragic, and there's some great episodes involving her, like one that we'll get to later in the season. But overall, this sort of callousness is exactly why I can't gravitate to her character as much as the comparatively more genuine rest of the supporting cast. But, you know, thoughts and prayers and stuff. Diane has to pull overtime in dealing with Mr. Peanut Butter's campaign, but also trying to take a stance on gun violence to no avail. A final shooting happens during the course of the episode, but this time it's committed by a woman, which THAT was the final straw for them to enforce gun control. Diane gets a great biting line at the end. I can't believe this country hates women more than it loves guns. Oh, also Bojack is in this episode. He goes to the nursing home to visit his mother, who now has dementia and cannot recognize Bojack. She is at the point where she needs to be better taken care of and has to move in with him. Bojack has resented his mother for decades, but now he can't even properly get revenge or talk to her about it because she doesn't even know know who he is anymore. She's practically a different person at this point. Bojack expresses to Hollyhock how he just wants to call her out for being such a shitty parent, giving Bojack the big F-bomb for the season, where the other F-bombs represented the end of a relationship with someone by their hand. Here, it was Bojack attempting to end it himself, an inverse of what we've seen previously but it doesn't matter anymore. He can't do it anymore, at least in a way that would matter to him or her. He'd be calling out a stranger, and even when she does recognize him, he has to act nice for the camera. And all the other times, she calls him weird nonsense names like Henrietta. I mean, who even is that? I guess only time's error will tell us if he ever gets to call her out. And if any of this matters. After his mom moves in with him, we also get the first instance of Bojack's inner monologues, being illustrated to us in a sketchy cartoon style. We see how Bojack truly sees himself as a stupid piece of shit, resenting almost everything he does on a daily basis. Whether it's eating an extra Oreo at breakfast, or spending way longer than he should at the bar. Everything else we said about Bojack and his mother get developed further here too. I find this episode to be a really creative and sad portrayal of anxiety and depression, with Bojack having this little voice in his head berate him for every single decision he makes, and coupling that with this rough art style. It's yet another example of this show going to great artistic lengths in order to portray its themes and messages. There's also a lot of interesting character stuff here, like Bojack's mother being obsessed with this doll that she calls her baby. What is that about? We may never know. Also, Bojack and Mr. Peanut Butter have to retrieve the doll after Bojack pulls one of his classic shitty person shenanigans and tosses it over the balcony. Turns out it landed in the backyard of insert real-life criminal's name 
here. This show is honestly the only thing I've ever known Felicity Huffman from until that thing she did in real life. I find that kind of funny. Oh, and the cotton candy Bojack vomited landed in her backyard. See? Season 1 did matter. No, you can't just skip it. Fun fact, when we first started writing the outline for these videos, we posted a picture of James typing out in the editor server, and the way they figured out it was the Bojack retrospective was because we mentioned Felicity Huffman, and that was enough of a connection for them to figure it out. Felicity Huffman. Not the fact that the words Bojack video were in the corner of the screen, they didn't notice that till later. Felicity is the key to all of this. <laughs> Never mind. This episode also brings back Sonic the Hedgehog, so he and Princess Carolyn can trap Meryl Streep into a contract or something, and it's really not important. All that matters is that Sonic is still a asshole, and you kind of feel bad that he has a family to go home to, and PC doesn't. But leave it to our old boy Judah to make her feel better. God, PC is so lucky to have him in her life. Good thing nothing will temporarily change that ever. Also, Todd has to get married to Courtney Portnoy, who I just want to say is really boring, and I don't know why so much of the season hinges on her and her shenanigans. They could have at least made her a animal, but she's just kind of this boring human lady whose only use is her name, which gets used for tons of Princess Carolyn tongue twister lines. Maybe a little too many. Honestly, looking back, this season may have been the start of an over-reliance on tongue twister lines as jokes. They're cute once in a while, but they just keep coming throughout the rest of this season and the next. But that's kind of a nitpick. Anyway, Todd is pretty conflicted because he doesn't think asexuals are able to marry, but his friends at one of the meets clear that up for him that they can. Again, I I don't find these explanations heavy-handed because this really isn't common knowledge. So it's pretty nice to see this stuff explained to Todd and us. The end of the episode is one of those classic Bojack big oof moments, where Hollyhock tells Bojack about the voice in her head that belittles her. She asks if you ever grow out of hearing that voice, and Bojack's like, yeah, totally. You stupid piece of shit, why did you lie to her about that? It's a really sad moment, but it's kind of nice to see Bojack trying to make her feel better at least. Hollyhock in general is a great addition to this season. With Todd gone, she's the new naive, optimistic foil for Bojack. But there's an extra layer here because she wants to look up to him as a father figure and he needs to try and look out for her, despite being Bojack. Their dynamic is really special, and something we haven't really gotten from the show thus far. We'll see this more later on, but I think in general, this is Bojack's best season character-wise in terms of how he acts. He never really does anything extremely malicious to anyone, which is a sharp contrast to basically every other season. And I think it's in no small part thanks to Hollyhock's presence that he tries to better himself. It's why I find their relationship in this season so special. The next episode is a big one. Earlier, Mr. Peanut Butter was challenged to defend fracking by opening his own backyard up to be fracked. He of course agrees to this and... Well, let's just say his campaign comes crashing down. Way down. I think there's a Fall Out Boy song about this, right? His house sinks into a giant sinkhole caused by fracking. So he, Diane, his campaigners, guests, and Bojack get trapped underground. This feels like a good time to mention that Zach Braff is in this episode, and we have to listen to his stupid voice. Gosh, how could anyone listen to a voice like that for minutes on end? Obviously, Diane doesn't take this too well, so she gets to spend time with Bojack for like the first time in a year. And you'll never guess what happens when those two gets alone together. Yeah, they get wasted. Once again, showing that those two are a negative influence on each other. As the week rages on, the party guests get more and more restless and eventually turn into complete savages. Killing Zach Braff and eating his flesh as sustenance. This whole ordeal is the breaking point for Mr. Peanut Butter's campaign, as Woodchuck attempts to rescue them, and eventually they get saved by a colony of ants. These ants cause someone somewhere to have a sexual awakening, and I do not ever want to meet that person. What I love about this episode is that it manages to be plot relevant and a hilarious escapade at the same time. It's funny to see the voice of reason Woodchuck get constantly drowned out by the insanity of Mr. Peanut Butter and his guests, but once they all turn on Mr. Penis Bobber, it becomes evident to him that he'd be a terrible governor. The fact that the episode where they all eat Zach Braff after setting him on fire is crucial to the plot just makes me happy. Overall, one of my favorite episodes of the season. I don't have much else to say about it other than it's absolute comedy gold. I mean, we even get to see more of Mr. Peanut Butter's second ex-wife, Jessica Biel, whose role in this episode as this crazy cult leader is really entertaining. I hope she doesn't overstay her welcome in this season. As for the next episode, Bojack stars on Booty Academy. I guess Bojack went from horsing around to assing around. How does it feel to be the subject of ridicule for once? Yeah, it would feel pretty bad. That is if I wasn't the one in control of the laugh tracks. <laughs> Alright, that's it for me. You guys have been great. Tip your waitress, try the veal. He also gets to test his abilities as a dad when Hollyhock goes on a date. He sucks at it. 
Mr. Peanut Butter ends his governor campaign only for Jessica Biel to pick up as Katrina's new puppet, and Princess Carolyn meets Ralph's family, who are very racist and suck. It fleshes out the relationship more, but as far as the overarching plot, that's really all there is to it. Okay, so in our notes for the next episode, we literally put Ruthie. Holy shit. I think that summarizes this episode pretty well. See, an alternate title for this episode could be Princess Carolyn and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, because that's what this is. But it's okay, because you know what the framing device for this episode is? It's PC's descendant from the future, telling the story of how her ancestor persevered in the face of all the adversity in her life. You see this, and you're kind of thrown for a loop. Like, oh wow, the show is confirming that she did end up having children, even though it seemed like she wouldn't, based on everything that goes wrong when she tries to. This is a weird anticlimactic way to confirm that, but still, it's really comforting to know that everything works out in the end. Especially since everything goes wrong for her in the present. She loses her clients to her arch rival, her treasured gold necklace turns out to be a cheap fake, she finds out Judah didn't tell her about an offer to merge with a larger firm last season, prompting him to get fired. It's all pretty rough stuff, but we keep coming back to Ruthie in the present. And we keep reminding ourselves, oh, it's okay. At least she does have that baby. At least something in her life works out in the end. Then it turns out she had a miscarriage, which... Oh, at least we got to see the albino rhino gyno again, but yeah, overall, that's really rough. But, but it works out! We see that it works out in the end. We just have to keep telling ourselves as an audience that it'll work out. Just like how PC keeps telling herself it'll work out. Besides, she still has her loving and caring boyfriend Ralph, who she just had a serious bonding moment with last episode. I'm sure he'll be there for her no matter what. It's not like Princess Carolyn's gonna get drunk out of her mind and break up with him. Yeah, that's exactly what happens, isn't it? God damn it. Rufy as an episode has been a gut punch on top of several other gut punches. Nothing, not a single thing, goes right for Princess Carolyn here. Her struggling agency lost a high-profile client, her love life and family life is non-existent, her best employee is gone, how could things get any worse? Well, at least we can take solace in knowing that her future turns out better since the titular Rufy is still running around in the future. I wonder how that presentation ends. Oh, it doesn't end. Because it never happened in the first place. Yeah, Princess Carolyn never actually has a child of her own. The Rufy we see there never existed. It was all just part of a fantasy Princess Carolyn made up in her head to make her feel better about what's happening. It's literally one of those fake scenario memes that get thousands of likes on Twitter. You know, the ones with the vibrator ads underneath? Ruthie is one of the most devastating episodes of the entire show, and I can say this as someone who doesn't even like Princess Carolyn that much. This is one of those episodes where regardless of how I feel about her actions in other episodes, I can still get wrapped up in the tragedy that is her life. How she works so hard and gets nothing out of it. How the episode ingeniously tricks us into believing there's a silver lining at the end of it all, only for it to get ripped away by the end. It's because of amazing episodes like this that we understand why so many people love PC so much and consider her the most tragic character in the show. If I had to nitpick what is overall an excellent episode, however, I'd say maybe her breakup with Ralph is a bit of a forced development. Like, by the end of the previous episode, her relationship with him only got stronger, since he went against his family and admitted to them that he and PC were having a baby. I feel like it's odd to go from that to immediately breaking up with him in the next episode. It feels like that plot development only happens to pile the tragedy on. It would be weird if it didn't happen in this episode, but I don't know. Maybe just take out the part where Ralph admits to his family they're having a baby and end it on a more sorry about my family, we good note than how it actually ended. But again, it's just a small thing. Overall, this episode slaps. And now for an episode that doesn't really slap, though not really through fault of its own. Loving that Cali lifestyle is emblematic of most of the problems I have with season 4, and why I don't consider it to be on par with seasons 2 and 3, despite its incredible high moments. I just feel like the overarching plots of this season were a bit rushed in the end, and this episode is the perfect example of why. So, the governor plot. It was really funny during the first half of the season, and it did a great job of driving wedges between Mr. Peanut Butter and Diane, but Man, did they not know how to end it. It just abruptly stops halfway through this episode when Woodchuck wins and the status quo is maintained, all because Jessica Biel doesn't like avocados. That's pretty funny, but at the same time, this is the end of the plotline this season. It feels like it didn't really amount to anything, because, well, it didn't, outside of driving Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter apart. And I feel like any plotline could have done that. Or just a series of loosely connected events. Ultimately, I feel like this plotline needed more of a punch to its ending. And I think that 
punch should have been delivered by Jessica Biel. This season tried so hard to make her the new character actress Margot Martindale, but she just doesn't have the same presence. She's just a watered-down version of Margot who never does anything particularly malicious outside of the Underground episode. This makes her character really boring, and the fact that the show keeps taking digs at her is weird. Like, I don't think society in real life really has much of an opinion on Jessica Biel, so it's not like all the jokes that make fun of her career really have that much of a punch. If this plotline ended with her trying to take the governor position by force, or holding Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter hostage in the final episode while they try to go to Hawaii, then I feel like it would have been a pretty solid payoff. Plus, the bell room scene could still happen. The only difference is, instead of a casual drive to Hawaii, Mr. Peanut Butter and Diane had to overcome a wacky serial kidnapping. That's really not that far-fetched for this show. I don't know, this plotline just really fizzled out at this point. The fact that both Katrina and Jessica Biel never appear again after this episode, outside of next season's Halloween flashback episode, really drives the pointlessness of their plotline even further. Katrina's evil plan was barely explained to us, Jessica Biel as an antagonist was barely utilized. Overall, a fun idea for a plotline didn't really pan out in the end. Though that plotline did give us one of the best jokes in the series. The man was a pedophile murderer. Well, if you gotta murder somebody... <laughs> Aside from that, there's the Todd plot. You guys remember back in 2016 when there were those weird murder clown pics that went viral and then ultimately culminated in nothing? Yeah, let's make that a subplot in a TV show a year later. Hey, the IT remake was coming out that month, let's get some Netflix money going. This was a weird and kind of uneventful subplot to stretch out for multiple episodes. Once you get past the admittedly funny concept of zombie clown dentists, there's not much here other than the introduction of Yolanda. Let's get to the main plot. Hollyhock overdoses and is sent to the hospital. Here we get introduced to her eight dads. One of which, as we said earlier, is film Twitter. I only watch foreign films. Fuck that guy. So now Bojack has to A, deal with them and prove it's not his fault, and B, figure out what happened. <laughs> While I think this is a good plot development since Bojack has to deal with his own lack of responsibility when looking after Hollyhock, my problem with this development lies with its lack of buildup. There's barely anything prior to this episode to indicate that Hollyhock is hooked on drugs, just a couple of scenes here and there where she acts a little off. Opening the episode with her being incredibly dizzy and disoriented really comes out of nowhere, without it feeling naturally built up to within the story. This is a show that's usually so good at natural buildups, but I feel like this episode dropped the ball a little bit in this regard. Anyway though, Bojack finds out it was his mom who was sus the whole time. She slipped weight loss pills in the Hollyhock's coffee which caused her to overdose. Bojack is naturally not happy that his mom ruined one of the only good things in his life, as she does, and arranges to get her put into a nursing home with the shittiest view ever. He's about to leave her for good when this happens. Bojack? Well, we made it. It's the dreaded episode 11 of this season, Time's Arrow. I'm just gonna be blunt. This is my favorite episode of Bojack Horseman, and one of my top two favorite episodes of television ever. It's basically tied with Ozymandias from Breaking Bad. This episode does the impossible and manages to humanize one of the most utterly despicable characters in the entire series, illustrating exactly what made Beatrice into the monster we know her as. From the perspective of her dementia-riddled mind, we see all the major events in her life that happened after what we saw in the old Sugarman home. I adore the structure of this season, how the second episode and the second to last episode mirror each other in terms of the stories they portray. They both stand on their own, yet they're both intertwined all the same. Furthermore, this episode answers so many of the season's ongoing questions Questions, things you wouldn't expect to see answered in a standalone story about Beatrice. It ties every aspect of this season together while also being a perfectly told standalone story as well. Where do we even start? It answers the big question of who Hollyhock's mother is, why Beatrice kept calling Bojack Henrietta, who the baby Beatrice keeps talking about is, and more context to some of the flashbacks from episode 2. And guess what gamers, it turns out some of those questions have similar answers. And by similar, I mean the same answer. As fate would have it, Butterscotch would eventually cheat on Beatrice with their maid, Henrietta. She would eventually become pregnant with Butterscotch's child. Upon finding out, Beatrice helps Henrietta and arranges for the child to be adopted. Guess who that child was? Which means that Bojack was never even Hollyhock's father to begin with. He was her brother. Everyone just assumed that by them sharing DNA, he would have to be her dad. But 
Obviously, a DNA test doesn't specify how you're related, just that you are. Brilliantly answering two of the biggest mysteries in the show yet, while not contradicting previously known information. The whole episode is just one big, tragically satisfying package. Imagine a tragedy being satisfying, what the fuck? In addition to explaining so many of the season's ongoing mysteries in subversive and satisfying ways, this episode is just a brutal story. By giving us insight into how a character as hateable as Beatrice became the way she was, it makes her eventual mistreatment of her son even harsher in hindsight. She's a lot like him. She was dealt a shitty hand in life and never really stopped to try and become a better person. Her mother had a lobotomy and her father forced her to conform to antiquated notions of how women should behave in society. As a young adult, she tried to fight back against her father's ideals. She had passions, she had goals, she had dreams. But her father was only concerned with marrying her off to a wealthy family in order to pursue new business opportunities. As an act of rebellion, she spends time with a debonair bad boy, Butterscotch Horseman. Things get a little steamy between them, and uh-oh, she preggers with Bojangles Horse Mangles. She and Butterscotch take this opportunity to elope and run off together. It's rough to watch their story seeing how genuinely in love they seem to be in the moment, while also knowing that they morph into absolutely horrible people who don't share a shred of love for each other. It only makes sense that there would have been a connection between them at some point since they married each other and had a kid, but actually getting to see it before it all went to shit is pretty surprising. The conflicts between Butterscotch and Beatrice continue to escalate, and she continues to regret the choices she made that led her to this situation. There's also a lot of brief, haunting flashbacks to different moments in Beatrice's life that both make you bemoan what a horrible person she's become, and also play into the framing device of her dementia. It's such a well-constructed narrative on multiple levels, thanks in no small part to this framing device. Eventually, it culminates with Butterscotch's maid, Henrietta, quote-unquote, getting herself pregnant. Yeah, okay, bro. After a surprising moment of vulnerability from Butterscotch, Beatrice agrees to talk Henrietta into giving the baby up for adoption. And it's in this moment where all of Beatrice's frustrations we see over the course of the episode, and by extension her life, come out. Where she tells Henrietta not to follow the same path she did, and waste her life on a man as awful as Butterscotch. It shows us that even now, after she's become the heartless, soulless witch we previously knew her as in the series, Beatrice still didn't deserve any of this. And she knows that Henrietta doesn't either. Does this mean Beatrice feels empathy for another person for the first time in ages? Yes, it would seem so. Her own, demented version of empathy, that is. This episode then delivers such a haunting, anxiety-inducing climax that shows how as much as Beatrice previously resented her father, in the end, his evil hooks remained in her long after he was gone. We get a parallel between Bojack's birth and Hollyhock's birth, which is neat, but then it transitions into a parallel between the immediate aftermath of Hollyhock's birth and the burning of all of young Beatrice's things due to her smallpox. Everything clicks here. Beatrice's father wants her to stop getting attached to her things, especially her baby doll. And Beatrice internalizes this sick lesson, preventing Henrietta from holding her daughter in order to stop her from getting too attached before the baby's put up for adoption. Beatrice believes this to be empathy, even though, rationally, it isn't. But it represents the mental scar that her father left on her throughout her childhood. The scar that only grew over time and warped her into the twisted monster we recognize. The editing, the music, the sheer horror of the fire. It all comes together into the most terrifying moment of the series thus far. I actually started hyperventilating the first time I saw it, which is something I've never done any other time watching a show or movie. It goes so hard and cements this episode as a devastating, perfectly plotted tragedy that left me breathless by the end. Speaking of which, how does it end? Bojack drops his mother off at the old folks' home after telling them to give her the shittiest room they got. He wasn't going to say anything, just dump her there and leave, letting her rot forever. But then something happens. She finally recognizes him. This sets Bojack off after the entire season, now she remembers him. This means he now has the opportunity to finally do it. He has her right where he wants her to tell her off and finally fulfill his promise from episode 5 and get his revenge. But he just sees her sitting there, alone and confused, and he just can't do it. He can't bring himself to ruin her. In a rare moment of empathy for his parents, he takes Mercy and instead has her picture the old Sugarman place instead of the actual dumpster outside and leaves her in peace. 
It's a touching moment to end this after all the suffering Beatrice endured in her life. Suffering Bojack doesn't even know about. So yeah, Time Zero is a true masterpiece. One of the best stories I've ever seen unfold. It's really hard to describe just how perfect I consider it to be from beginning to end. And fortunately, the actual ending episode this season is pretty good as well. So the big finale. Let's start with Princess Carolyn since she gets the big lead into season 5. After her really bad time in Rufy, I almost said Ratatouille, she struggles to get back on her feet. And in an attempt to get a new production titled Filbert, which just so happens to be the same name as she wanted to give her baby earlier, she has to make amends with Bojack after what happened in season 3, since Turtle Top won't greenlight her unless a star is attached. Princess Carolyn's ultimate lesson this season is that after four seasons of being the one helping others get their shit together, she learns that she needs help too. It's okay to need people. In the end, Bojack gives her the advice that she should maybe try adopting a child instead, and it's nice to see the two reconcile after this whole time. So just like that, Bojack has a new show and Vim has a potential hit to get out of the red. Todd and Yolanda are still dealing with the fallout of his failed zombie clown dentist venture, but they managed to turn it into a better business. How? Honestly, it's not really important. What's important here is that once their business is concluded, Yolanda suggests maybe going out with Todd sometime. He feels the need to tell her that he's asexual, but as it turns out, so is she. You can actually see her in the background during the asexual meetup earlier in the season. And that's a pretty neat hook for next season. The idea that Todd has found someone he could date without having to be pressured to have sex. There's something about this last shot of him that I really like, where the camera pans out and we see all these people dressed as him, as a result of his fashion show escapade earlier in the season. But there's something more to it. It's the idea that, as an ace, Todd may feel alone, but there's a ton of other people out there just like him. Maybe more people than he expects. It's just a really nice shot that subtly conveys that, and I don't know, maybe it helps me feel a little seen. I don't know. Anyway, how are Diane and Mr. Poopy Burger doing? Badly! So they try to go to Hawaii using that bridge from earlier in the season, but there's a bunch of traffic, so they end up staying at the roadside, uh, seaside hotel and have a nice romantic night as a couple for once, showing that things may be on the up and up. Diane calls back to the birthday party from season 2, where Mr. Peanutbird gives her a ballroom. Here, while laughing in retrospect about the situation, Diane explains that what she actually meant was a bell room, as in Bell's Library from Beauty and the Beast. After that night, they say, screw the vacation, and head back home. This is where it all goes wrong, as Mr. Peanutbutter called his guys to construct the actual bell room as a surprise, and I'm gonna be honest here, they didn't even try with that paint job, what the fuck? Diane, however, has a bit of a breakdown. See, she never actually wanted the room to be real. It was just a fantasy she had to comfort herself, not unlike Rufy. But now that it's real, it's not hers anymore. It's just another one of Mr. Peanutbutter's wacky antics. She has no safe place to retreat to just for herself anymore, and this is where their entire relationship has been headed this whole time. While Mr. Peanut Butter may have been hearing her, he never truly listened to her. I feel like a lot of people argue about who's in the right here in this scene, and there's not really an obvious answer. Yeah, it's clear that Mr. Peanut Butter wanted to do something nice and didn't mean to be malicious at all, and maybe Diane overreacted a bit. But at the end of the day, this is yet another instance of him doing what he thinks is best for Diane without actually considering her perspective. Just like the birthday party in Season 2. Just like the entire run for governorship. How many times does she have to say that she doesn't like big gestures or that she wants to be consulted before he does something big and crazy like running for governor? This scene seems like they're gonna go back to normal at first and this is just another fight, but no, Diane just can't go on like this anymore and it's hard to blame her. But it's also hard to blame Mr. Peanut Butter because he's not trying to hurt her in any way, even though his lack of perspective does. It's rough that this is how their marriage has to end, but at this point, it's pretty clear that it does have to end. At this point where we were writing this, James looked over and saw that we just got onto the 16th page of the script and said, 16 fucking pages. And you guys wonder why it takes us so long to work up the motivation to write these. Hey look, it's Boge Boy Horse Body! So Bojack's story, how does it end? While talking to Princess Carolyn at a diner, Bojack has a bit of a Matthew Perry the Platter Human realization and discovers the truth behind Hollyhock's mother, so he bursts into the humble abode of her eight dads to give Hollyhock the phone number. Bojack gets to prove himself to her fathers after what happened last time where he was virtually defenseless. 
I would like to give a special mention to the use of the stupid piece of shit sequence used here. In the original episode, these moments were used as Bojack's inner monologue that he would use to berate himself. But here it's used to convey him discovering the truth about the mystery that they've been trying to solve this whole time. The tool that was previously used for self-deprecation is now the tool used to give him authority. In the end, the dads tell Bojack they'll give the number to Hollyhock. However, in reality, if you manage to decode their secret language they use, it's shown that they're only really telling Bojack what he wants to hear. Luckily, Hollyhock overhears him talking about it later on and gets the number to her mother that way. Though her dad's reason for not giving it to her was due to her still being sick from what happened earlier, so it's not too far-fetched to say that they may have given it to her on their own regardless. But before the credits roll, he gets a call from Hollyhock, in which she says that she has reconnected with her mother and insults Jared Leto. Then out them, best TV show. Bojack is a bit bummed that he doesn't get to be a father, but Hollyhock leaves him with a bit of uplifting information. She may not need another dad, but she's happy to have a brother. This episode is a great ending for Bojack and Todd, and acts as a good satisfying end for the stories as a whole in a way. While Diane and Peanut Butter have a bit of a cliffhanger, if you wanted to end things here for the main character himself, you could, and I feel like it would be a satisfying ending. Of course, there's still two whole seasons to go, but as far as this storyline goes, that's it, roll credits. So, Season 4. It's a good season that overall isn't as great as the two previous, but it still has some incredibly strong stuff. In fact, on its own, some of these episodes are some of the best material in the entire show. It feels like an epilogue to what happened in Season 3, and a good prologue to the last two seasons, kicking off the big arc we're about to reach for Season 5. Yeah, Season 4 is yet another excellent installment in BoJack's story. I do still love it for its excellent standalone episodes and great overarching storylines, but I feel like there were just some elements of the season that dropped the ball. The lack of any tangible payoff in the governor race, the way Hollyhock's overdose kind of came out of nowhere, the complete lack of character actress Margot Martindale. Seriously, this is the only season where she's completely absent, and I'm mad about that. But seriously though, even though this is the first time since season 1 where I feel like the storylines could have been fleshed out a bit better and concluded in better ways, for the most part, this is still the BoJack Horseman crew on their A game. Delivering a season that's more tender and personal in some ways, and more chaotic and insane in others, which is pretty on brand for this series. It's a more than solid chapter for the show, and it contains some of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. I'm giving it a big ol' 9 out of 10. Great stuff indeed. Okay, William, how do we end this part? I got it. Here, hold this. Bye, bitch. Huh? What is it? Why, why is it on fire? Wait, what the fuck? Haha, -ha, I came back as a ghost! Fuck you, William! Man, coming back as a ghost is such a valuable skill. But it's not good sponsored transition material. You know what is? Being a dentist and a clown at the same time. Now that's impressive. Wanna know how you can become skilled enough to take on multiple jobs like that? Through Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. With topics like illustration, music production, film and video, and much more, you can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. This is a site that legitimately makes learning new skills fun and easy, since the lessons are broken up into short chunks that you can watch at your own pace. It's so engaging as a result. With Skillshare, you can find inspiration in the moment and learn how to express your creativity. Right now, I'm really enjoying Productivity for Creatives, Build a System that Brings Out Your Best by Thomas Frank. It's really helping me reshape my mindset when approaching creative projects and YouTube videos, and it offers a ton of great advice on how to be more productive with these endeavors. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get 30% off an annual premium membership, so you can explore your creativity. Even if you've already had a free trial of Skillshare, you can still take advantage of this offer to get a full year of unlimited learning and creative exploration. So what are you waiting for? Click that link and get ready to explore everything Skillshare has to offer. Yeah.